So anyway, one of my uh, heroes, a hero only in that he gives me so much information to work with. Uh, so there are known knowns. These are the things we know we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. They, there are things we don't know we don't know. So today I'm going to tell you about the unknown unknowns. About the things you don't know. I actually know a little bit about. So there are unknown unknowns to you, uh, and hopefully at the end of this hour, 45 minutes, you'll be a little more familiar with them. There'll be a whole barrage of information. So if you miss something, you're not going to do well on the test. So stay awake and stay alert. All right, uh, very quickly, um, and, and now I, I say this in, in all sincerity, we owe you all a, a great, a lot of, uh, what's the phrase? I'm debt of gratitude. Debt of gratitude. <laughs> I just wanted to say gratitude of debt. Um, a great debt of gratitude for what you do. We couldn't do it without you. Uh, and really, you're not just people who come in here. You're actually part of UC Davis. And if you're not familiar with UC Davis, it's a major research institution. Where uh, currently 34,000 students. I read last night an email from our administration that by 2020 we're going to be at 38,000. Uh, so a lot of students, a large fraction of those are graduate students uh, like Derek attending one. If you believe in these sorts of polls um, that are done, whether we're the sixth or seventh or the eighth leading public university, it doesn't matter where you are in that group. We're in that top echelon um, of groups. Um, and something like $750 million uh, of annual research uh, that is done. So take, coming in from that large UC Davis scale, here we are in Nevada. Uh, Nevada. Um, you can never say Nevada. Um, here we are at a UC Davis facility, the first UC Davis building. Uh, that was a lead platinum building, uh, one of the first laboratories in the world that was a lead platinum. And so we share this with Sierra Nevada College, we have labs here, offices here, we have what you're here about, our outreach center um, on the first floor. Um, and these are some of the sorts of pictures we take and the sorts of activities we do. We have a whole Suite of new things coming online this next year. I'm not going to talk about those because I'm sure Heather will be talking about them uh, in way more detail than, than I have time for. But there is things are going to uh, to be changed. All right, we think about, and I'm not sure what Dave Antonucci covered earlier today, so some of this may be repetition. I, I know he does a great job. But we always think here we are in the Tahoe Basin. This is the watershed. Yes, it is. We look at the mountains, that's our watershed. But we're really just the top of a much larger watershed. So this is the watershed where our, our water comes in from, but it leaves and it goes down to Pyramid Lake. So really, there's a larger watershed that we're a part of. What I've shown here in this Cape Proud is a separate watershed. Uh, this is the watershed associated with the, with the Carson River. The reason I show that is that there are actually transfers of water from here across to this to this watershed. I also found out today that come uh, beginning of July or end of July, those transfers are going to stop. There's going to be no water for agriculture, irrigation in Fallon because pretty soon there's going to be no water flowing down the Truckee River. Something that we'll touch on later. Okay, so Lake Tahoe, 11th deepest lake in the world. Anybody know what the uh, deepest lake in the world is? Okay, you cover that. I know. I was testing if they were listening. <laughs> <laughs> they were. Very good. Lake Baikal is the deepest. Uh, so we're about 500 meters deep at the deepest point, average about 330 meters. Big thing that you'll hear time and time again if you haven't already heard it. Part of the reason for our tremendous clarity is we have a small watershed, 800 kilometers, square kilometers seems big, but 
the lake is 500 square kilometers. So relatively speaking, it's a small watershed compared to the lake. Things like the Great Lakes have watersheds that are maybe 10 times the area of the lake. And that's the norm for many lakes. Mean residence time, 650 years, meaning essentially the water, if, the, if no water came into Lake Tahoe and it just flowed out of the Truckee River every year at its usual rate, it would take 650 years before it was all gone. So a lot of people live under the misconception that, well, in order to restore Lake Tahoe, we have to wait 650 years and get rid of that old dirty water and, and get new clean water. It's not true. There are processes within the lake that change that. And our best estimates are the, is that if we had all the money in the world and all the best science, then maybe that could be accomplished in 20 or 30 years, not 650 years. Of course, we don't have all the money in the world, and the science is evolving all the time. Okay, keep Tahoe blue. This is not our logo. Leave the same Lake Tahoe. I've had this as a logo for over 50 years. And what they really mean by that, or what they meant by that when they started it, was to stop the decline in the lake's clarity. Okay, so here's Captain Brett. He's he does a lot of this, posing for photographs. <laughs> he barely does a scrap of work. This is just here, this is my good side, and then taking from that side. Uh, but here he is about to take a Seki depth reading. Um, and so what, what do we do with these Seki depth readings? Well, one of the things we do is, every, whenever he takes it, he makes a judgment, a very calculated judgment about what the conditions were like that day. So if it was a very windy day, an overcast sky and the like, he'll take the reading, but we won't really use it. We'll put a little asterisk next to it and say, this is not really a high quality reading. It has to be a clear day, a still day, a measurement taken in the middle of the day. And so typically there are about 20 or 25 such measurements that he takes, uh, and we do this grueling scientific mathematical procedure. Some of you may have heard of it. It's called averaging. <laughs> we take those 25 values, add them all up, divide by 25, and we come up with a number. And each of these dots represents such a number. It's the annual average second depth for that year. So I don't know what this one is, say 1990. Actually, yeah, that is 1996, uh, because this was the worst year ever, 1997. Um, and this, so whatever this is, 20, something like uh, 20 meters, 19 meters was 1997, and that's about 65 feet. That's how far down into the lake he could see on average during that, uh, during that year. You see, there's lots of variability. Or even trends, where it gets better for maybe six or seven years, and then there are periods where it gets it gets worse. Okay, that was for the whole year. If we actually, so let me go back to that. So one of the things we've been talking about a lot in the last few years is that this trend line that we've run through there has actually flattened out. If we were part of this figure 10, 15 years ago. We have a straight line going through that data. For the last 10, 15 years, there has been a flattening of this curve. It hasn't come down yet, but it may. It may start coming down. We don't know. Mathematically, the best we can say is that the decline has, has been arrested. If we look at the winter months, and these are the months when it's actually clearest in the lake, statistically speaking, it is getting better which is tremendous. I mean, there's been a huge amount of science, a lot of investment, a lot of hard work by lots of people to be able to say, well, for, for this time of year, things are getting better. It's a tremendous achievement. But we can stop patting ourselves on the back. If we look at summer, we can see that statistically, the best line that goes through all these averages for the summer is a straight line, meaning it's getting uh, at the same rate now as it was 30 years ago. 
Lots of other, lots of interesting things happening there, though. I wish you could put those dotted red lines through there. It seems to go through this pattern of declining clarity. So I've been able to see lower and lower into the lake, and then it improves. Back here, it was getting worse and worse and worse, and then five or six years of improvement. Anybody know the reason for that? I don't either. <laughs> um, but it's something that we are working on. That's something we do want to understand. Now, I'm about to do something that I told all, all the staff here they can never do, and that's to give you some insight into one of the most recent measurements we've taken. We normally don't release this data until the following year, the average. But I was out with Brant last week, uh, because I was there, he actually took a real measurement. He didn't just pose for photographs. <laughs> he was doing a bit of that, too. And this was summer. And you can see the you know, average values in the summer you know, are something like 60 or 70 feet, or whatever that is, you know, 18 or 19 meters. What was the reading you took last Tuesday, Brian? It was 28 meters last week. 28 meters. Ooh. Yes. This level. So, the lake is saved, everybody. But it's unusual. I mean, it's unusual, and uh, without giving too much away, this summer has had remarkable clarity. So, if you look at it in the context of this plot, it's showing that this summer, we don't know what the average will be yet, it's going to be. Well, it's going to be a continuation of this. Maybe it'll just keep going down and down. I doubt. Uh, but it's it's indication that this is a very dynamic lake. It's changing. Uh, it changes day to day <coughs> and year to year, and even with longer periods of time. Okay, so part of our story, uh, part of the story of the lake is why has this decline occurred? And uh, the best we can figure out, and this, uh, when I say the best we can figure out, this was a 10-year program that cost a couple of hundred million dollars involving probably uh, four or five dozen universities and consultants and research labs around the country, um, was that the main cause of the decline is very fine particles. Dust. Microscopic dust that's entering the lake. And you may say, well, why has it just entered the lake in the last 30 or 40 or 50 years? And the reason is that that dust was often there before, but the basin was different. We didn't have so many roads and shopping centers and houses, and so when that dust landed on the earth, it infiltrated into a meadow or a stream bank or something like that. It was absorbed by the, was held by the vegetation and eventually washed into the soil. Now it lands on a road, it rains and the snow melts and those materials get washed off the road, they run across the surface, they go to the stream, they go to the culvert, they end up in the lake. So it's these very fine particles, 5 by 10 to the 20 ton. It's a very big, it's a ridiculous number. It's kind of imagine how, how much that is. It's huge. Um, but that's what the estimate is. And where does most of it come from? Most of it comes from this big orange part of the pie, which are the urban areas, the, the roads and where we live and where we shop, uh, and so on and so forth. Other things contribute relatively little. So that's why a lot of the efforts by the agencies are now going to these urban areas. Doesn't mean we forget about everything else. There are other inputs to the lake that matter, maybe not so much for clarity, but for lots of other ecological reasons, the nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, and they come from, from other areas. So we can't just focus just on these urban areas, even though that's where the fine particles come from. Okay. So, these particles are something like between 1 and 10 microns, and it's just a 5 by 10 to the 20th is a hard number to grasp. What's a micro? So to make that easier for you, you have a dog. Your dog is about a million microns long. Your dog has fleas. They're about 3,000 microns in size. 
head of a pen, 2,000. Thickness of your hair, 100 microns. If you've ever changed copier, a toner in a, in a photocopier, and that liquidy black stuff you get on your hands and your clothes, that's actually very fine particles, about 10 microns. And bacteria, like E. coli, are about one micron. So the particles that are affecting Lake Tahoe are somewhere in this range. And this is a distribution of road dust, of the, the, the number of particles in road dust according to size. And the peak number is sort of in this sort of one, one to three micron range. So that's a, a large part of our problem. That was a story, and that was sort of almost gospel five, six, seven years ago. And then things changed, as they always do. Um, a lot of people took that to mean, well, if it's road dust, then it's not biology. Biology doesn't matter for the lake. The biology changed in the lake. The algae, the little microscopic plants that float around, for a reason we'll see in a minute, they started to get smaller instead of being 50 microns, where they didn't really affect the light very much, smaller species came along. Species that were, the scale here, 2 microns. Suddenly, biology is the same size as these particles, that, these, this dust that's affecting the light. So suddenly, in the last five, six, seven years, we have realized the biology really does have a role in affecting clarity. Okay, so I pose for photos sometimes too. Uh, I want to show you something about lake motion. You look out at the lake on a beautiful day, if you're last week, it was just so calm and warm here, you looked out, the lake was just motionless. And what I want to try to show you is that it isn't motionless. It's actually, it moves a lot. So this is something called a drogue, it's like a, an underwater kite and it's attached to this buoy. And when it's all put in the water, what you see is a buoy floating on the surface, the kite in the water, um, and the currents in the lake push this kite around. And inside this buoy is a, basically a GPS that can communicate with the satellite. So as the currents push the kite around, the GPS gets, record, gets recorded and sent to the satellite, and we can, we can track this. I'm going to skip over that one in the interest of time. And I'm going to click back to you before. So what we're going to do is we release three of these in this location. And this is sort of time along this axis. And this is day 236, 237. So each of these marks represents one day. What you're going to see is a red drug a blue drogue and a green drogue, these are their velocities. Um, the peak velocities of 30 centimeters a second, a foot a second. It's actually pretty fast in the way. You're going to see them move. On what was a pretty, a pretty quiet week. It wasn't as if there was a, a raging storm taking place. Again. And there. So you've seen this red line is showing you the passage of time. So okay, this is the beginning of the day. I see that green guy? In less than 12 hours, it goes from the east side to the west side. We all know the wind comes from the west to the east. But not always, but sometimes. But these things, they can move rapidly. They sort of get caught up in bays and so on and so forth. And so with these, we can actually get a sense of the magnitude of the current, where things move. And you look at this and you say, first thing you say is, wow, isn't that great? And then you say, well, that's kind of pathetic because you've got big lake, 11 deepest lake in the world, and you've got three of these things. I mean, what's happening here, here and there? And it'd be great to have these everywhere. So we can't afford to have them everywhere. Which, if you'd like to grab your checkbooks now, <laughs> and you can take them. Um, what we do very often is we take measurements and then we build models. Models that represent the physics 
the equations that describe the motion. And we use what we learn at these you know, three locations to test our model. So what I'm going to show you now is the result from a model. So think of each of these, these dots as these droves, as these things that were floating around. Now they're, they're going to be driven by the wind and the currents. Um, and what you're going to see is a two and a half day period in time where they're moving. So we've got blue ones in this quadrant, light blue there, and yellow and red there. And these little green things you see are just showing you the direction of, of the current at that point. This is pretty amazing, because you're going to see not just before what we are seeing is like real measurements are taken just in one tiny corner. All right, you ready? This is going to change your lives. <laughs> It will, I guarantee it. Whoa, Whoa thank you. <laughs> yeah, this is after just 18 hours. Look where the, the colors get totally dispersed. The rest of the day, it's less than the day. So before we were getting a little bit of an idea of what was happening down there, now we have a sense of what's happening everywhere. Again, it's a model. Not real measurements. Part of the work we're doing now is to test whether the model is accurate um, in different places around the lake. Okay, I'm going to show you another model result because showing the whole lake there is really interesting. But what if you have a, a particular interest in a particular part of the lake? Say, for example, uh, you were interested in, or you wrote, a water supplier on Lake Tahoe. So if you live here, most of the water that comes to your tap comes from the lake. South shore, it's a more groundwater. Let's say in the southeast corner here that I'm showing, most of it comes via some pipes. You go out to about this depth. And so these people are very concerned about maybe pathogens and people swimming you know, at these, at these beaches, or they're concerned about the spread of invasive crabs. So again, using a similar model, but now with much higher resolution. A model that can resolve, meaning represent, 20 meters, 60 feet. So the length of this room, the size of this room, would be one model cell. So what I'm going to show you now are the motions that you would see, again, this is during summer, in this corner of the lake. And so you're just seeing little streamlines here. So you're seeing this two hours of travel. So what you're seeing, you see these little water seas that are forming here. You're seeing currents coming up the shore, occasionally coming down the shore. That's, every time it changes, it's one hour. So this isn't showing where particles go. This is showing like the velocities at these points. When it gets dark blue, it means a large velocity. Each of these lines of part of there is like two hours travel time. So anyway, it gives you an idea of two things, just how variable it is day to day, and also just the small scale details uh, of the flows that are occurring there. Okay, so who's, who knows where Emerald, oh, Emerald Bay, who knows where Tahoe Keys is? Tahoe Keys are. Okay, every place to everybody. So they're down here on the south shore. This is the mouth. This is, sorry, the, yeah, the, it's where the upper Truckee River entered the lake. It used to be a marsh, largest marsh in the Sierra Nevada. Now it's uh, Tahoe Keys put in the, in the 1960s. And it's considered a major environmental blight. Hope nobody here has a home at the Tahoe Keys. <laughs> and and I, I feel sorry for the people because most of them bought it, their second or third or fourth owners, and they didn't fill in the marsh. But um, it's their home. So one of the interesting things about Tahoe is that there are, there are no herbicides or pesticides or chemicals that are allowed to be discharged into the lake. So among the many problems that Tahoe Keys has, 
is that it has an invasive, a problem with invasive species. Um, in particular, this, this plant from the raging water milfoil um, sort of clogs up the keys and, and the like, but it also provides habitat for warm water fish and, and a range of other species. So there's been a lot of interest of late, in the last few years, of trying to deal with the problem by using herbicides, saying if we use herbicides for one or two years there, then maybe we can get on top of this Eurasian water milfoil problem. They've tried mowing it and pulling it, but it's just they never get on top of it. And so there's a lot of interest in that. So they were given permission to, to do a study, not with herbicides, but with a tracer. And now there's an application pending to use herbicides. And so an interesting question would be, well, why have some of those herbicides got out of the Tahoe Keys? Because there are currents moving in and out of the Keys, and they say, well, we'll block them off, but maybe they'll, they'll do an imperfect job of blocking them off. And so the question is, where would these currents that we've been seeing moving around the lake take herbicides if they were released? Well, what we're seeing, nothing's going to move in this. Um, but what we're seeing here is the result of running this model, I think, this was over a two week period. So every two hours for two weeks in the model, we released 100 say, particles, say, particles with herbicide attached. And the wind was, was using the wind records from the lake. And what we have here, each of these green dots represents where after 24 hours, those each of those particles would end up. So clearly, there are a lot just around here. So those particles didn't travel very far at all. But then there seem to be three major pathways. Some go to the west, very close to the shore. Some go to the east, where all those drinking water intakes are. And some, for whatever reason, are heading up. Well, the reason is because that's we have very very predictable winds uh, and so predictable currents and that's where for part of the time that's where they're driven. This is the this line is the two meter contour. So this is a water depth of about six feet. So most of these particles are staying within that the swimming area of six feet. So I found this really interesting. This is the location of two of the drinking water intakes. Now this is not to say, <coughs> this is not to be my caveats. As the, if the herbicide was to get out of here and spread, lots of things are happening. It's getting more dilute. The sun is breaking it down. So it, it may not pose any problem at all. All this was designed to demonstrate as well. The natural currents have the capability to carry it where where there are people, where there's drinking water intakes. We'll see where that, where hot water that lands us into. Okay, talking about invasive species. All right, quagga mussels. Do we have quagga mussels in Lake Tahoe? No, we do we try? No, no. Yeah, that's what yesterday. All right, good. Uh, do we have Asian clams in Lake Tahoe? Yes, we do. Do we have Adam's mouth bass and bluegill? Yeah. Do we have hydrilla? Ah, gotcha. No, not yet. Not as of yesterday, anyway. Um, hydrilla, it's common in many lakes. It's terrible for boating and the like. We have other plants like Eurasian water mill farm. But this is something. These are all, well, I guess they're not invasive to everywhere, they're someplace they're native to. Um, but certainly in western lakes, they're all, they're all invasive. But our biggest issues right now are with Asian clams, warm water fish, uh, and Eurasian water milfoil. <coughs> I didn't have a picture of Eurasian water milfoil, but I had one of hydro. Right. Uh, so, uh, we've done a lot of work on Asian clams. They're very small, about fingernail size. Uh, the worst uh, summer for them, we've only really known about them for about 
Well, they, was, they showed up about 10, 12 years ago, but just a couple of shells and nobody thought they would survive. And then, lo and behold, in December of 2008, they not only had survived, but they were flourishing in the southeast corner of the lake. Interestingly, right where all those currents are converging. Um, and so what you're seeing here is Marla Bay. This green is not the Asian clams. These are, this is an, an algae that grows in association with them. What the, what the Asian clams do is they filter in huge volumes of water. They take out the nutrients from that water. They take out the algae. They consume them. But they excrete probably 80 or 90 percent of what they take in. And that excretion puts highly concentrated nutrients into the water, which then allows this pretty bright green algae to, to flourish. So Brian's photos, the left is what most of Lake Tahoe looks like in the near shore. Very clear sandy bottom, and the areas affected by Asian clams look like what's on the right. One of our early tasks was using an unmanned submarine to literally go around the whole perimeter of the lake looking for these, or at least looking for evidence of their shells. Fortunately, it, it only found them in the areas where we already found them. So what it demonstrated to us is that we, and then this was interesting, where we found them was, was essentially where, where people, people would call us up and say, hey, I found a strange shell on my beach, or this strange algae I've never seen before, and we would go down and see it. So, it's sort of a really good example of how we, we, we need to rely not just on docents, but also the general community. We, we can't be everywhere all the time. And clearly what this demonstrated is where they weren't, people weren't complaining about them. And so the you know, general public turned out to be a very efficient and much cheaper tool to use than this submarine. Uh, one of the techniques we came up, we devised to uh, to treat them was to use these rubber mats, we call them benthic barriers. The benthos is what the sediments are called. So this is just pond liner. If you have a pond in your backyard, that black film you buy at Ace Hardware, that's all that is. You spread them out on top of these, these clam affected sediment, and what they did was cut off the oxygen. Oxygen went to zero in 24 hours. These little bugs could last a month with no oxygen. But then eventually they, they succumbed, either from the lack of oxygen, boredom, whatever. <laughs> they, just, they just threw in the towel. Um, and so that's probably Brandt is one of those divers. Uh, these are some little test plots we did, again, down in Marla Bay. Um, this was a bigger experiment in Marla Bay. It's hard to see what you're seeing. This is a, another unknown unknown. The shoreline is over here, so this is a light blue, shallow water. This is the edge of the shelf where it just drops down into deep water. This is one of those water lines I was telling you about. And that is a half acre set of these rubber mats um, at the top. This white area, this arc you see here, there are the shells of dead Asian clams. So this is a pretty graphic photo. Okay, so that was tremendously successful, like a 99% kill rate. Um, at about the same time, we found, we discovered there were clams right here at the entrance to Emerald Bay. Uh, and this was, I'm not sure if you've been to Emerald Bay or you're familiar with it. Emerald Bay is like a totally different lake. I'm going to keep playing quickly. Totally different lake. Um, it was carved out by glaciers. And so 10,000 years ago, there were glaciers through here, they carved out the earth, and they stopped them out here. So there's a sill. All the pushed up dirt from here is right across the entrance here, and then it drops off into time. So it's only a few meters deep there. And that's where the clans were. They're on the sill, this amalgam of material from this whole, whole valley. Um, and so, we thought, well, maybe the same technique would work, or maybe it wouldn't. But it turned out it sort of worked, but it sort of didn't. And the reason it, it had its challenges is, remember before we had this nice flat bottom, we put the rubber mat down, and 
the oxygen was cut off. Right here we have a sill, like a little hump. We put this mat on top, but because this is so homogeneous, there are boulders and rocks and sand and everything, we believe water is flowing through that. And as that water flows through that sill, it carries oxygen. So our mat is sort of like, um, I'm not sure, it's not doing as much as it did in Mala Bay. So this is still ongoing, so I shouldn't say what the conclusions are, but it's, it's had a lot of challenges. Also because there are very strong currents that go through there, they keep moving the mats. So every so often the clams get exposed, and, and so it's had its challenges. Okay, so it's a huge production. This was now five acres of mats. We had students working down at UC Davis. <coughs> taking these mats, putting grommets on the side and putting them into rows and the like. And there was a barge hired. Um, and part of the strategy here was to put this material, it's like, um, it's aspen, aspen trees. It's just like, you ever see on a construction site, there's sort of those, as, those logs they put there to absorb stormwater and run off? This is the same material, but it's, it's a long, it's a hundred foot long sheet of it. The idea was we put this under the mat, and as it decomposes, it consumes oxygen. So it was like an extra way of getting rid of the oxygen. So it, it made deploying it a lot more difficult. That's what some of the mats look like, and this is what it looks like underwater as divers unroll these five acres of aspen and, and rubber. And this is what it all looked like when it was probably a quarter of the way complete. All right, climate change. It's great for you. Um, all right, I have to give you a, like a, an introductory lesson in limnology now. Do you really know what limnology is? Study of lakes. Okay, limnology 101. What you're looking at here is the profile of the temperature, water temperature, with depth. So this is temperature scale here. This is the depth scale. So you see at the very top, zero is the top of the water, and it's sort of pretty uniform in temperature to about 40 or 50, about, sorry, about 20 or 30 meters, and then it drops off in temperature, and then it's pretty uniform. Okay. Now we give. This is pretty simple. So in order to make it less simple. We give all of this very complicated names. Okay. So we call that top part the epilimnion. So why? We could have called it the top, but that was too simple. Epilimnion. Down the bottom, we call that the hyperlimnion. And the middle part is the metalimnion. The metalimnion is this part where temperature is changing rapidly with that. All right, these are terms you're going to hear and see and, and use and grow to hate. Uh, this is called the thermocline, this region where the temperature drops up very quickly. Uh, and so the important thing is that these divide different parts of the lake. So this epilimnion is where the wind is acting and there's often a lot of action up there. That's where oxygen is entering the lake because the waves breaking and things like that. Way down here, there's no oxygen entry. This is, the waves are happening way up there. Okay, so I'm going to march you through the air now. So this is uh, in March. So in March, it's cold, in the winter, it's the same temperature, top to bottom. Okay, so there is no epilimnion or metilimnion or hyperlimnion or any linear. The spring starts, so May, you start to see it, it stratifies at the surface, meaning there's a different layer forming at the surface. You have a thermocline going all, almost all the way to the top. A couple of months later, it's still warmer at the top. It's uh, July, middle, middle of summer, 4th of July, it's coming and going. It's whatever that temperature is, 16 degrees Celsius. It's 
about 60, 65 degrees Fahrenheit. <coughs> All right, now the interesting part starts. Oh no, it doesn't. Okay, September, take a moment yet. It was ever end. Okay, now the interesting part starts. So this is, this is the stratification time of the year. So during this whole time, if I was a molecule of oxygen, I would be stuck at the top. There's no way I can get to the bottom. The only way I can get to the bottom is by being mixed down to the bottom. But that's not happening. I'll show you why in a minute. As we start going to the next month, November, you see we go from here down to there. It's cool, and the surface has gotten deeper. If we give another couple of months, in January, we've gone from this back down to, there's a slight stratification there, and then we're back to March again. That's always very cool. So that, the initial picture I showed you was actually from November. Okay. Why is this in there? So okay, so that's the normal pattern of the lake. So with climate change, it's getting warmer, we all know, we all know that. The big threat to any lake, not just Lake Tahoe, is not that the water is going to get a degree warmer. I mean, that's, that will pose some challenges and changes. It's that that pattern we just saw is going to start changing. Because everything that lives in the lake is totally keyed in to that pattern. Okay, so we'll come back to that in a second. So has climate change been observed? Yes. 100 years of data here, this is weather, air temperature data now. Minimum temperatures since 1910 have been going up. Maximum temperatures have been going up, not quite at the same rate. Uh, an interesting thing, in the last eight or 10 years, temperatures have been cooling. Even in the maximum, it's been going down. That's something that's been observed worldwide. Okay. Lots of other things. Snow is a fraction of annual precipitation. How much snow is falling? Well, in 1910, 50% of the time there was snow. Now it's something like 30, 35% of the time. But lots of changes year to year. Snow melt timing. What do I mean by that? Talking about the rivers now. As the snow melts because it's getting warmer, we get sort of the peak in the flow occurring Earlier, uh, it used to happen in June, now it happens in, in the middle of May. So two or three week events. Um, and the water temperature has gone up. Again, the last eight or ten years, it's actually cool, but there have been periods before where there was cool. The overall trend, and that's in everything we do, it's a huge system, there's so much inertia it isn't what happened between this year and last year, it's what happened in the last 10 or 20 or 100 years of that. And that's one thing you really have to stress to people. You know, say, it was cold last summer. That was last summer. It's a trend that lands. Okay, surface water temperature. Last year actually was exceptionally warm, the warmest temperatures we've ever recorded on average. So this is the whole year, January through, through December. So you see, it has been a long term trend, cooling the last eight or ten years, but it seems to be the well, last year was hot. I can't say we're back on a warming trend. I have no idea if we are. Um, bottom temperature, that's going up too. Not many people get to experience what happens at the bottom of the lake tower. <laughs> um, but you can see the temperatures in 1970 when Dr. Goldman was down there at, at a depth of 450 meters measuring temperature. was about 40.4 degrees Fahrenheit. And now it's sort of about 41 degrees Fahrenheit. But lots of, lots of changes year to year. Lots of these very sudden changes, and those sudden changes when something gets cool are those years, maybe one in four, one in five, when in winter the lake mixes all the way to the bottom. It doesn't happen all the time. Okay, this is that data. This is showing how deep the lake mixes every year. 
So these long bars indicate it mixes to the bottom. These short ones indicate it mixes to just 300 feet from here. So you can see since we started recording data, there hasn't been much of a change. It's sort of, it mixes to the bottom every four or five years. Okay. Has everybody played with one of these? <laughs> I've seen somebody play with that. So this is, this, is, you know, this is very light, it's full, it's inflatable, but down the bottom it's very heavy, full of sand or water. Punch it, bounces back. Punch it, punch, bounces back. This is very stable. It always wants to return to its condition. So if you think of a lake, we were saying in summer, we went through the Nology 101, in summer, it was very cold and very dense at the bottom. At the top, it was warm. It's very stable. It's not going to, to turn over. This thing isn't going to flip over either. As we get cooler and cooler, as you go into winter, the density between the top of the lake and the bottom of the lake becomes the same. And at that point, a storm, some wind, can literally make the whole lake turn over. And that's when oxygen gets to the bottom uh, and things like that occur. It's a great thing. It's a natural thing. It happens in most lakes. Lakes that doesn't happen in have no oxygen at the bottom terminally. Okay, this is the... Um, how do I explain this? These green dots represent our measured data. And what they're, what they're showing here is the beginning, the day of the year when stratification begins, when this lake is resistant to mixing. And so if you see, there's a slight downward slope here. So day 150 is like the end of May. Okay, so end of May, it's starting to stratify. That's starting to come a little bit earlier. The green dots at the bottom is showing that the fall is lasting longer and longer. It stops being stratified. The end of stratification used to be day 320. Now it's day 335. That's the climate change we've seen in our lifetime. This is where we measure it since 1968. What these red dots represent are model results for the next 100 years based on what's considered a plausible climate scenario. Assuming carbon dioxide keeps going into the atmosphere at a certain rate and governments respond in certain ways and the like. It's not a prediction of what will happen, but it could happen. And what we're seeing is that the stratification is going to start sooner, it's going to end sooner. The lake is going to become very different, a period of time when Oxygen gets to the bottom, is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And so when you look at what is going to happen to oxygen, this is like now we're switching to models again. This is the depth of the lake. This is time from say 2001 to 2100. The colors here represent oxygen. So blue, lots of oxygen, color. 2073 and all that, this red represents zero oxygen. So if you have a lake front property, now is your time to sell it. I will take it off your hands <laughs> at a very fair price. Um, it's a model. Models aren't truth necessarily. They may um, so one of the things we're doing now is we have instruments at the bottom of the lake. This is off Glenbrook in 440 meters of water. So think of it, the bottom of the lake, 404, what's that, 1400 feet down. We're measuring temperature, measuring oxygen, and it's just going to be nothing happening there. And the wind is like, half a mile above you. And so what I'm showing here is data from, from June of 2013 till November of 2013. So we just saw that during this time, the lake is stratified. I 
I just told you. All the mixing and action is at the top. The bottom is very quiet. So the red represents temperature, the bottom of the lake. And this was this came as a surprise to many of us, at least to me, how dynamic it was. Just as these fluctuations means that water is moving there, that something driving it through these huge changes. More surprising is the oxygen. What I was expecting to see, this is the blue line, was oxygen it would just sort of gradually be drifting downwards. And that's what we wanted to measure, is the rate at which the lake would lose its oxygen during this period when it was stratified. What we found is that there are things stirring, stirring the bottom of the lake. So once again, this is an ongoing story. I wish I could tell you how it ends. Um, okay, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up in five minutes because you've had a long day. A year and a half ago, or two, two years ago, a borrowed glider. This is great. It's like a, it's like a submarine, but it doesn't require power. Uh, very uses very little power. So what it did is it went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth across the lake. So this comes out the idea. Brian can go out in the lake and take a measurement. Uh, temperature all the way to the bottom and they'll work really hard to do that and they'll come back and they'll share it with us and we'll say that's really great Brad. Good job, well done. But all we have is a vertical profile at one point. What this thing does is it goes, it dives down to about two or three hundred feet, taking measurements all the way down comes up, takes measurements all the way up, measurements, 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 doesn't stop for lunch, doesn't stop for coffee, gets the other end, comes to the surface, looks where it is, gets its GPS, turns around, does the same thing. Did that for two weeks. 24 hours a day, Brent, measurements all the time, <laughs> never complaining. You're about those online educators, Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> So that yellow line back and forth across the lake. So really, what I'm going to show you now is what it's like taking a, a slice across the lake and seeing what it measures there. It takes about 11 or 12 hours to go across the lake. So it's like a, it's a bit like a photograph, an image, but it's slightly blurred because there was a passage of 12 hours. And again, this was really illuminating. So this is oxygen. So I guess it goes out to 500 feet. I was mistaken. So 500 feet. This is the west shore, somewhere near Homewood, north of Homewood, and this is the east shore, somewhere near Stan Harbor. The blue represents cold water. The lighter colors represent warm water. And what would, and this was, I should say, during this particular day that I'm showing you, there was this roaring wind from the west to the east. So what we're seeing is the impact of that wind literally pushing all that warm surface water, that epilinear water, across to the east, making nice, warm swimming conditions at Sand Harbor. <laughs> Meanwhile, back in Meeks Bay or somewhere like that, it's freezing. Um, so again, the lake is really dynamic. It isn't just temperature that's moving, this is just heat. So this is algae, chlorophyll. So all the algae, in a very still lake, they'd all be up in one layer across here. Now, these algae can be pushed up, lifted up, and these algae get pushed down. As they go down or up, they get exposed to different amounts of light. They grow at different rates. So again, what's happening is is changing constantly, and this is this is oxygen that's changing. All right, I'm going to step it up. Forget that. Uh, forget that. Forget that. Forget that. Forget that. Okay, I'm going to end with this. So this is our latest thing. Um, we call this a near shore network. The idea is basically this. You know, we know a lot about what's happening in the middle of the lake. We don't know it all. There's way more 
to learn, so for you to call up. What we know the least about is the near shop. And that's where most people live, or at least experience the lake. Uh, and that's where there are a lot of concerns these days about algae or rocks or invasive species. So the idea here is let's measure what's happening in the near shore. Unfortunately, whereas the place where Brant goes out in the middle of the lake is pretty representative of most of the middle of the lake, the near shore changes everywhere you go. And so what we're doing is instrumenting about 20 to 25 sites around the lake. How are we doing this? Well, we're partnering. We're partnering with people who either have docks or and, and are prepared to let us put these instruments adjacent to their docks. And most importantly, they have the means to pay for the instrument. So this is one such dock. And the idea, and this is sort of what the, the system looks like. There's a dock, there's a little box on shore, there's an underwater cable that goes out to our instrument. This is the instrument. And I'll show and tell. The instrument will sit there on the bottom, right here. And it has these three sensors. You see those three little circles, they're optical sensors, it's like, it's, it's like a, a little laser, if you will. One measures turbidity, the small particles in the water. One measures chlorophyll, the algae in the water. And the third one will measure what's dissolved in the water. And so it will, it will measure that, it will send the data back every, still working it out, every 30 seconds, every minute, back up this cable, we go onto the internet, we also get power from this cable. What is this going to be? Essentially, these blue dots are the places we want to have these installed. Right now, we have seven of them going in. So there'll be seven in at the end of summer. Wait there, Derek. They'll be in. All right. Um, uh, actually, we just got part of the equipment arrived today. It's 450 pounds of equipment. And that wasn't even this part. It was just a, a short of it. So this time next year, this talk will be very different. We'll probably, I won't have to talk. We can just go online and we can see what's happening, what the differences are between, say, our, our site at Senate Harbor and our site at River Rubicon. And we'll be able to see the effects of these these motions. I always mean, take pictures of my fly. <laughs> Try to fly. Uh, and you'll be able to see you know, when, because we can measure in real time stream flow, we'll be able to see if we're getting there's been a storm and we have um, whatever so a, a large flow coming down General Creek. Is this going to affect the northern uh, side or the southern side. Where's that stream water going? How important are the streams? How important are the urban areas to the nation? So with that, <coughs> finally, morning. thank you again. We really we could not do it without you. That's a part of heaven. Have you ever seen it? <laughs> 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 But really, I mean, we, you know, we have tremendous Americas, we have Allison, we have Heather, but they, they can't be here every, every afternoon like you are, so I applaud you. Okay, we already have people arriving.